Welcome back, everyone, to another Whiskey Wednesday with Vinny's Beverage Depot. I am Pat, joined by Joe and Brett from the Whiskey Hotline. Our special guest tonight is John O'Connell from the West Cork Distillery, one of the three founders, right, John, of West Cork? Yes, indeed. Okay. Um, so uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to talking about this distillery. You've got a really fascinating distillery that's grown quite a bit, uh, even in an industry that's growing quite a bit. Um, so can you give us some background on when West Cork started and kind of how you guys came together to start this thing? Yes, um, and number one, thank you for the opportunity to um, be on the show tonight. Um, West Cork Distillers, we formed in 2003. Um, it's a peculiar company in a lot of ways. Um, myself and two close friends um, set up the company, um, Dennis and Jerry McCarthy, who are cousins. We all grew up um, together in a small fishing village in West Cork called Union Hall, which is um, a small fishing village of about 120 people. Um, I often say that the next village west of us is Staten Island, so um, <laughs> we were quite located really on the Atlantic coast. Um, after school, I did a PhD and a BSE in colloidal chemistry, only to find out there were no jobs for colloidal chemists in Ireland in the 1990s. So left Ireland and worked for Unilever in corporate research in the United Kingdom, Netherlands and Japan. Um, and then came back and joined an Irish ingredients company called Kerry Group, um, a company which I, I loved working for. I often say um, um, leave, joining Kerry was um, the second best decision of my life and leaving it was the best um, because it was the opportunity <laughs> to set up West Cork Distillers. But back in 2003, Dennis and Ger who had become deep sea fishermen, um, you know, fishing became a very challenging exercise and livelihood in West Cork. The lads had young families and they looked for an alternative. So um, at that time, Irish whiskey was in growth, but maybe under the radar. So we looked around at different projects and eventually we decided to set up West Cork Distillers. Um, we did so with no money or no experience in the drinks industry. So um, we set up very small and grew very organically with no marketing budget. In um, 2013, we moved into the local town called Skibreen. Um, it's a small town of about two and a half thousand people. Had a population of around 50,000 at one point, but was decimated, yeah, it was, um, decimated by the famine um, in Ireland in the 1850s, which reduced the population of Ireland from about 9 to 11 million people down to about 3 million people. Um, we set up in Market Street in Skibreen and um, moved to 24 hours 7. And at that moment in time, we were heavily reliant on new make spirit and selling new make um, because of the fact that, um, you know, we didn't have investment of any significant form. So concurrent to laying down our own Irish whiskey, we were laying down new make for other people. Then in 2016, we moved to um, a new facility called Marsh Road in Skibreen. Um, ironically enough, it was formerly um, the um, location of Union Hall's Fisherman's Co-op, which um, closed down, unfortunately, because of the demise of the fishing industry. Um, myself, Din and Ger had actually worked there as kids. So there was a bit of an irony to that moving in there. It's um, a 12 and a half acre site. Um, we would um, distill, mature and bottle on site in, um, at Marsh Road. Um, there's about 120 people employed. It operates 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week. And um, the still host there, as I mentioned earlier, has at the moment um, 13 stills operating 24 hours a day. That will increase to 16 in a short time um, in the next coming months. So, um, it's been um, it's been a very enjoyable, very challenging journey, um, you know, and um, one that, you know, doing it with your own friends is a great experience, you know. That's really cool. I, 13 going on 16 stills is uh, <laughs> pretty mind blowing. I, uh, you know, the three of us have been to many, many distilleries. I don't know if I've seen anything like that, certainly under one roof. Um, are they all the same or were they built by the same manufacturer? What's the breakdown on those? They won't be actually. Um, the history of this is quite unique in that um, all the stills that were operational in Market Street were all brought and were all built by hand in, in West Cork by West Cork people. 
So um, we had five operational whiskey stills and one um, gin still there, all built by hand by West Cork craftspeople. And they, they were all brought to Market Street. Um, one of them is quite well known. It's, it's technically name is the TPS. We don't name our stills after um, children or anything like that. They're all given technical names, but it was um, christened by the operators in the plant as the rocket. It's um, a still that can go from ambient to 100 degrees Celsius uh, in about seven minutes on a good day. Oh, um, cow. Yeah, so it's purported to be the fastest still in the world. Um, whiskey still anyway, for that matter. And um, so- Well, and this is, and did I, I called the right picture. That's the one over my right shoulder, correct? It is indeed, but yes. Um, so it's um, quite a peculiar shape. Um, quite interestingly, most stills would have a heating coil to um, wash ratio of about three to 400 to one. This has a heating coil to wash ratio of two to one. So, um, you know, that allows you greater surface area so that you can heat quicker. Um, we'd be of the opinion that the first distillation is all about, you know, just recovering the alcohol. The second and third distillation are about um, purifying that alcohol and um, creating the heads and tails cut. So um, that's quite unique. Um, in the expansion into Market Street, we've actually bought a couple of stills, well, quite a few stills from um, projects that didn't quite get um, on the road uh, in Ireland. So we bought a couple of very conventional frilly stills, which um, we dedicate to malt production. We continue to make pot still in the Market Street stills. And then we have um, three hybrid stills and one continues still making grain whiskey. So. Yeah. And that's is, and I wanted to focus because I think people could having been through because sometimes people don't understand how amazing it is that you guys you th there's a mindset that it still has to look a certain way or behave a certain way. And, it, it, and that, that only certain people can make them and it's amazing that basically a chemist, a chemist and a couple of fishermen decided we can do this. Yes, uh, well, I mean, and, and but they but very, very clever and very, very handy because a lot of, I remember, and we don't have pictures you see, like you talked about the way you set up the Market Street Distillery with your flow plate yes, and the sir. fact that you can so narrowly control where every single ounce of liquid moves so readily and so easily. And you designed and built the whole flow plate yourself as well. We did indeed, yeah. We built the flow plate in Market Street, which is 93 different ports which is essentially Brett, like um, a telephone exchange where you can divert the flow from one to another. Um, I remember one time um, um, giving an Englishman a tour of the distillery and um, we walked him around the distillery and um, he, um, at the end of the distillery said um, it was a fascinating distillery, um, but how did um, a scientist and two fishermen come up with such a sort of complex um, distillery? And um, I hadn't thought of it at the time, but um, I, I, I sort of gave him the response that um, being a fisherman, you're about 500 um, uh, miles off the coast at any one given time. Um, you have um, what is called the bilge pump in the hull of the boat, which um, pumps water that leaks through the boat out. And so when your life relies around moving liquid, liquid from one location to another 500 miles off um, the coast, of all of a sudden moving wash and spirit um, 100 meters isn't such a big challenge. <laughs> right, um, right. I think another thing about the ethos of West Court distillers, um, which I feel very firmly about is um, um, a lot of the employees are um, former fishermen or, farm or farmers. And in my opinion, a good fisherman or a good farmer is um, um, fairly agile and able at plumbing, electric, electricians, as um, carpentry, at fabrication. And we always ingrained that ethos that, um, you know, everyone has to be a problem solver in their own way, you know? So that's quite yeah. a approach. And it is, and if you write, and just for reference, even though, you know, the roads, it's not the easiest place to get to. It's not like you have, you don't have a motorway running from you know, Cork, Cork Town right to 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 skibo you it's i mean it's it's not it's it's a tough way to get and you're if you do the math you're basically employing five percent of the community 
Yet, um, West Cork has become quite a significant employer in the West Cork region, which is um, it's a great um, thing to have. Um, you're quite correct in that um, it takes almost longer to get from um, Cork City to Skibreen, which is West Cork, than to get to, from Cork City to Dublin, which are on either end of the um, country. So, um, you know, once you get to Cork City and want to go westwards, the road quality deteriorates quite considerably and um, it's <laughs> quite challenging for people not from West Cork to be able to navigate those roads. Yeah, well, how much do you have to pay your lorry drivers, your, your truck drivers, to get stuff in and out of? Luckily enough, um, we actually employ all local haulage companies, um, so they're familiar with the roads and um, they'd be good guys. They're, they're, they're quite good at it, but um, we have had experiences of, um, you know, drivers from um, continental Europe that... Um, have um, arrived at the door with their um, knees hitting off each other in trepidation and fear, you know, having navigated the road. <laughs> so, John, what's the total potential output of the distillery now um, in, with, with all these stills running? In total, between all these stills, we're at around 4.5 million LPAs, um, which... Um, you know, would make us small in comparison to the larger Irish entities, but it would be, you know, among the independent distilleries, it would be one of the largest. I mean, it's that's large even for Scotland. I mean, to put that in perspective for some of the audience here, I, that's bigger than a distillery that you may have heard of, like Lagavulin or Laphroaig, right? I think those guys are around. Like Lagavulin is bigger than that now, but it's bigger than Lagavulin. I mean, that's that's a yeah. sizable amount of of alcohol being distilled that's really impressive um yeah well especially the way that it's grown it's not as if that is you know i mean it's planned but again just the way you've grown and, and from nothing it wasn't like you were a market where you could make a vodka or a gin and just go here you go and start immediately generating money i mean you kind of had to put all those together i mean i remember the first time there really was no west cork whiskey the first time you and i met john you were just getting ready to launch. We were at a, a board via function in Dublin and you were just getting ready to launch whiskeys. Yes. No, it's, um, it's been um, a very challenging and rewarding journey. Um, it's, 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 we've had our growing pains. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, um, we, we were the first new distillery in Ireland since Cooley. So, you know, and that was back in 1987. So, um, you know, when, when we came on uh, and started, it, it was quite a new departure for the industry in a lot of ways. And we faced a lot of challenges because of that, you know, but um, thankfully it hasn't worked out too bad, thank God. So we're so interesting and then to get onto the whiskey, which I think yeah. that we want, because it's St. Patrick's Day and it's, it's later for you, still yeah. it's a quarter past 10 for you? It would be quarter past 10, yes, indeed. Quarter past 10, CC. So we're just starting. Your evening is getting ready to wrap up. Our evening is just for our folks here <laughs> is just starting. It's a quarter past five. But, you know, one of the things which is what all the work and all the complexity comes into absolutely fantastic whiskey. And right now, the focus we're doing, the bourbon cask. Um, yeah. Today, we just kind of picked the bourbon cask and then the, the, a couple of new expressions that are coming in. So tell us a little bit about as you were developing and building the distillery, where, what was on your mind in terms of what you were going to make as West Cork? I mean, you guys can make any whiskey under the planet that, that would fit Irish. You can make pure pot still, you can make grain, you can make malt. And you would do, did a lot on contract, as you said, when you started thinking about what is West Cork going to be about, what did you think about? Um, well, this was, um, um, but like it was important for us to um, stay true to our own heritage. Um, you know, all three of us, um, you know, we came from just a standard background in terms of whiskey consumption. Um, growing up in Ireland, you know, in the, uh, in the um, 80s and 90s, um, there was essentially three Irish whiskey brands um, on the market, um, Jameson, Powers and Paddy at the time. Um, interestingly enough, um, in the Cork and Kerry region, Jameson wasn't known, you know, it, it wasn't a brand at all. It was Powers and Paddy were the, yeah. um, the established brands in the Munster region. 
Um, Jameson would have been more dominant in, in, in the Dublin region. But, you know, we grew up to um, Powers and Paddy and Jameson being the norm and um, and blended whiskey being the norm. So, you know, it, it was very sort of um, important to us that we create a, a nice blended Irish whiskey and um, that we sort of um, make a whiskey that's accessible to the everyday man and a whiskey that you can drink, um, you know, as a casual drink. Um, as well as that, we obviously created the shoulder products in terms of the single mods and everything, but the West Cork bourbon cask, which is this one, um, is um, a, a lovely accessible um, blended Irish whiskey, 75% um, grain, wheat, um, wheat grain. Um, uh, all the grain comes from Ireland, which um, is, we think, very important. Um, and we will always endeavor to use exclusively Irish grain. It's 25% um, uh, malt. The malt, again, is um, sourced in the Irish Malting Company in um, Cork. Um, from local Cork and Munster farmers. Um, it's aged in first fill bourbon casks, 40% um, ABV, 80 proof. So, you know, it was very um, important to us that um, the whiskies that we developed, that they related back to us as individuals, you know. Um, you know, uh, quite a few of the other independent Irish distillers, they, they go for the more um, premium and super premium categories. Um, for West Cork distillers, we're we're very much focused on having an offering across the spectrum, you know. So um, that that was very important to us, you know. And you can dig out. Well, you can you can go super premium. You just did, if you find anything that's been sitting around now since you first started distilling, which was like you said, two thousand and three, two thousand three. So see, so you could have some eighteen year old kicking around somewhere back there. We could, but it's unlikely to be honest. Things were things were very tough, you know. Um, when we started off, um, you know, um, we we were heavily reliant on new make contracts, and um, you know, we had to liquidate liquid, um, you know, um, as soon as we could, really. And um, that's the truth of the matter. Um, we didn't have the cash flow to be able to um set down whiskey and leave it age indefinitely we 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 had a sort of equity um transaction in um 2018 2019 um where we a small um a small equ equity share of west court distillers was owned by a third party um and we chose to redeem them so that was another situation where we had to liquidate more of our stock to facilitate that but you know that's the choice and tributations of trying to remain independent and um, yeah. it's sure. it's it's not something we're ashamed of you know so you've done so and you you know it's interesting because you talk about honoring the tradition of irish whiskey but you've also done some unconventional things at least compared to from different sorts of wood finishes coming up to your your the the way you've approached doing what in Scotland would be a peated whiskey. I mean, a, a smoking regimen to introduce some of that character, which was that ever traditional in Ireland, sort of like it was in Scotland and then became untraditional. And then well, when you talk about the Glengariff and... Well, um, peated Irish whiskey had always been in existence in Ireland, um, but there was change in regulations. One was that, um, well, three main change of regulations. One is that the um, capacity of the pot still increased to 1,500 gallons. Secondly, that um, um, you had to distill more in urban centres, and um, that actually moved from using peat as the as a source of um, fuel to steam. Um, so um, there always had been a history of peat as Irish whiskey, um, and um, that's sort of an, an anomaly that you know people um, don't seem to recognize. Pardon, um, don't seem to, uh, or that that was sort of lost in translation, where people were defaulting to peat as Scottish and Irish as non peat That 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 history isn't as clear cut as um, one might think. But uh, in West Cork distillers, we took um, a very active decision that we would not, um, we would not still peat as um, wash in our stills, for the simple reason that we 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 think that um, you know. Um, getting the um, cleaning down the stills afterwards and residual yeah. essential oils, we, we just thought that it would muddy the water so too much. So that was a 
proactive decision that we made. So um, one night at home, I was um, cooking my tea and um, on a gas cooker. And um, I was just cooking away and I was saying, thinking to myself, isn't gas such a fantastic um, fuel to cook with? Because it's a complete pyrolytic reaction. You've no smoke. So it suits um, cooking food in, in a confined um, area very well, i.e. your kitchen. But I was thinking, is it the ideal um, fuel to actually char casks with? And perhaps would it be much more interesting to try to char a cask with um, a fuel that isn't fully pyrolyt and pyrolyzed, where you get flame, but also you get smoke. And um, you have the charring reaction, which breaks down hemicellulose and lignans into sugars and vanillin type compounds. But also you get an impact of the fuel um, of, the, of the smoke. So um, we developed um, two products, one of which is the Westcourt Glen Gareth series, well, two products within the Glen Gareth series. And one is um, from peat, which is harvested from a local forest in West Cork. Um, and the other is bog oak. Um, we sort of proactively wanted to choose some fossil fuels that would be, or sorry, non-pyrolytic, non-fully pyrolytic fuels that would have a West Cork heritage. And um, we thought, why not? Um, a lot of people may think that's, um, that's um, a little unconventional and perhaps it is, but if you actually go back to um, char casking in its original form, it, it would, from what I see is um, a lot of time, um, it would have been done like that, where people would have put just fuel into a, char into a cask and set it afire in order to clean the cask surface. Um, so, you know, again, it might be new departure in modern day Irish whiskey, but, um, and modern day whiskey, but maybe existed for quite some time otherwise, you know? Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know if anybody else is doing anything like that. Do you have yeah. to char the cask for, an extended period of time versus a more traditional char when you're using these uh, the bog oak or the peat? You would indeed, yeah. You wouldn't get the same period. You wouldn't get the same heat. And um, because it's a, it's not a full and fully pyrolytic um, combustion, so you would, and you want to take, you want to get the, um, uh, we actually bellow air into it. Um, so it's traditional bellowing technology. So you don't want to bellow too much air in because you just um, in create a very robust flame. You want to get it a very subtle reaction. So it would take quite considerably longer, yes. Yeah, you see behind, there's the, <sighs> Yes. if you look behind, there's the, the machine where everything. Yeah. Um, Bob would like to know if we could speak to the taste of the peat chard cask and if any of us have tried it. Bob, I've tried it, but it's probably been, I don't know, maybe two years or something since I had it. Um, and I recall it being a, a pretty moderate uh, peatiness to it. Uh, how would you describe that, John? Yeah, it would be, um, it would be um, quite a moderate peatiness. You, um, you, we, we've done a phenol calculation that comes in around two to three um, parts per million phenol, so it won't be overbearing, which we think suits um, a triple distilled Irish whiskey. Um, you get the um, the upfront sort of medicinal phenol content, but then the actual um, nature of the single malt um, actually comes through more so in the finish. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a lovely, delicate whiskey in a lot of ways. Um, uh, it would be my I prefer it actually. I think to the bog oak. The bog oak is a lovely whiskey, but it's um, extremely challenging. You know, um, very high in sort of spice and um, and and such like. Mm -hmm. But there and there, the whole key is because you're talking about the phenolic level is low, usually for a lot of people just overtly perceptible as smoke, it usually needs to be somewhere around 10 ppm generally, but you pick it up as it's, it's a basically like a nice flavor nuance, rather than overtly, which a lot of people don't like, you're right, it's, it's, it's just a new flavor nuance rather than just overtly whammo, yes. like a cloud of smoke blowing in your face. Um, friend of the hotline, Erin Regan on Facebook says, happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, and she's wondering if she can get the eight year single malt or the stout cask out in California. Um, I can't speak to California distribution. John, are, do you know if you're available out on the West coast of the U S we do indeed. Yeah. We work with a company called wine warehouse in California okay. um, through our import um, partner, MS Walker. Um, so, um, it's my understanding is, yes. 
Yeah, they should be able to then. Well, Aaron um, Maloney, Maloney can find it for you. Um, there we go. Um, and we also had uh, Gary pointed out that the bellows that you have in uh, to Charlie's cast are made with the help of a fifth generation local blacksmith. They are, uh, yes, so indeed. worth pointing out, apparently. Um, back to the back to the bourbon cast real quick. I just want to point out what a phenomenal flavor uh, to value ratio. I think that is you find a lot of other inexpensive Irish whiskeys that uh, I described a whiskey we tasted earlier as kind of whiskey flavored vodka here um, up in the whiskey hotline office recently. And I find that so, so many cheap Irish whiskeys, I think are just so flavorless and have a lot of high tone alcohol character. And this, uh, this bourbon cast from West Cork is unbelievable. And that's just pillowy and soft and there's so much vanilla to it. Um, it's really, really wonderful whiskey. So, I mean, and then we've got it on sale right now for something like $23 or, or 22 bucks or something at Vinny's, which is a pretty unbelievable price. And, and John said, and John said, you said your grain, you said the grain, your primarily small grain is wheat, right? Wheat, right? And wheat. is that, is that something, A, is that something that is common because it is, that was chosen obviously because you can buy it in Ireland, which is what you, you, you want to do. It, it, would that be the most common grain to use? in grain whiskeys or how much corn or maize would be used versus wheat typically oh, by a big distillery? Oh, um, um, wheat would be a tiny fraction of the, yeah. the total amount. Um, my understanding is there's only two distilleries in Ireland um, using wheat. So, um, you know, that would, wheat would be very small in the, to in the total. Agency. But that's again, what would contribute to good taste and, um, you know, that nice sweetness and body from the wheat um, spirit, you know? Yeah, definitely worth pointing out. I mean, most grain whiskeys now are just cheap, cheap corn. And there's right. something you said for, for that, the soft mouthfeel that wheat contributes here and that subtle sweetness, I think is really excellent. And how much experimentation did you have to do to settle on? I mean, how much did you have to play around before you sort of settled on what exactly you wanted to do? Well, to be honest, um, um, but it was a case of actually being um, dealt the cards we were dealt with and having to deal with it, to be right. honest. Um, wheat, I don't know, do you know, but wheat is um, a horrendously difficult grain to um, work with in the distillery. Um, yeah. Probably as bad as you can get. Um, it's um, got a terrible tendency to foam. Um, it's hard to um, gelatinize and hard to um, extract as well. So it's not the easiest grain by any means. Um, you know, uh, a, a grain with um, a higher starch content would be much easier to deal with. But I suppose from West Cork distillers perspective, you know, we did want to use Irish grain. You know, um, we, I, I think, be quite respectful of the fact that um, um, Irish whiskey as a category belongs to the Irish nation, not to any individual. And, um, you know, the Irish farmer should benefit from that, you know, as much as possible, as well as ourselves and just not just the distillers, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, that was important. Yeah, no, that's good because it is, it's tough too. The only, by reputation, I think the only grain that is that, that, that people might say is as hard or harder to work with is rye. Yeah. yeah. Right. And rye for the opposite reason, right? Because rye really gelatinizes and just turns into just like a blob. Glue. Yeah. The, it's yeah, a glue thing. that you can't move. Would you, is there any rye? Is there any, have you played around at all or, or, or done anything with rye? We've um, done a very small amount with rye, not a whole pile, to be honest, but there are other Irish distillers that have done quite a lot of rye. So I think... Um, mesh bills containing rye whiskey will become more and more important in Ireland in the coming future. Um, hmm. yeah, that would be my understanding. But I mean, Yeah, so how much rye is proportion is the amount of rye grown in Ireland very small, I would guess, or is there a lot? Oh, very small, I'd imagine. Very small. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, because um, it... Go ahead, Pat. I, I was just going to say, let's uh, probably move on to the eight-year single malt. Um, yeah. You know, as while we're talking through different grains, I mean, uh, malt, malted barley, of course, is famous for its use in whiskey as, you know, an easier grain to work with and it aids in, you know, starch, you know, you get these enzymes that aid, aid in starch conversion and all that jazz, uh, easier to ferment, easier to work with. Uh, all of your various stills have, the single malt is just then going to be made on a pot still, of course. Uh, have you run, do you run any malt through the column stills as well? 
we, we we don't really we did some initially on the commissioning um stage but um no not as a rule of thumb we wouldn't do but you're right um i remember over in market street and um, like the lads um would um they'd rejoice when they go back on uh, malt after a period of um, <laughs> like, um it's so much easier in every way leaving and uh, milling it and um you know there's every single aspect of it is so much easier you know um but um, we'd be fortunate we work with the Irish Malting Company in Cork and they've, um, you know, appointed um, a, a number, I think, 20 or 30 different farmers that supply into us. And um, it's it's nice to be able to make that link between the farmer and the distiller. So we've been fortunate. But, um, um, you know, um, it, 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 the malt is far easier, there's no doubt. So. That's, uh, that's really admirable. I mean, uh, Brett and I... And Joe, too. We're at an unnamed uh, large distillery in Scotland a few years ago that makes a lot of whiskey and a lot of grain whiskey and, and malt and a lot of gin. And it was cheaper for them to import grain neutral spirit made from corn in the United States and tanker already made GNS to this massive distillery in Scotland to then make gin out of than to bother distilling their own grain. And that's the direction they took it just because that's what, you know, that's what the accountants dictated uh, as a decision for that distillery. So it's pretty refreshing to see somebody actually, you know, trying to give back and contribute to the local farm economy uh, in their local area. I think it's, it's really admirable uh, from a distiller. And especially the focus, have you had any marketing are you going to, because we know that, you know, Mark Renier is doing a little bit of that, doing a lot of that at Waterford where he's tying back of, do you have, any ability or have you done anything isolated so you can tie back to a specific farm we we well we can tie back um to the amount of farms that we um source um grain off um but we can't be honest at this point tie back and tie back a specific whiskey to a specific farm we don't have that capability at the moment um from a scientific perspective um I'm not entirely convinced of the concept of terroir at this moment. Um, so you know, I, I think it's, it, I, I absolutely um, admire the sustainability and the traceability and all that to do with sourcing local, but um, I, I'm just not entirely convinced at this point about um, terroir um, and whiskey. I just, it, there's so many, so much points of obscuration. Um, right. Yeah my opinion i'm just not entirely convinced sure there's so many things that you write and understood there's so many other fat there's so many moving parts yes even the same terroir can be influenced right because the same farm can be influenced by weather year every year is different yes mm -hmm. um, yeah interestingly enough actually i did um, just for my own satisfaction one time i did my own study on alcoholic and um, fermented so I use either wine and beer and uh, alcoholic spirits and um, I put um, a hedonic score on each unit operation and um, so if you use grain versus fruit there's loads of water and fruit and fruit is a solvent and um, solvents absorb solutes so and solutes are invariably flavor compounds um, so obviously I gave um, a fruit a higher hedonic score than a grain, which is low moisture, predominantly starch. And I did that the whole way um, from um, raw material selection, the whole way up to casking. So um, if a spirit or um, fermented beer wasn't um, cast, it got a very high hedonic score. If it was cast at um, low ABV, it got a middle hedonic score. And if it was cast at high ABV, it would get um, a low hedonic score because um, obviously at a high ABV, the um, solvent quality of the product in the cast will suck more out of the wood and um, the wood will become a bigger influence. Um, the, um, the product that came up with the highest possible hedonic score for um, terroir in my silly study was um, natural cider. Um, and the spirit that um, came up more uh, highest was um, Arak from Sri Lanka, where you have a natural fermentation in the, and um, a very sort of nominal maturation and a very crude distillation. So, And that's coconut, right? 
Yeah, some DJ. That's it's coconut. Great. Yeah, that's coconut water distilled. Sure, 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 sure. It's and, interesting you say because we just had, I was able to a couple of weeks ago work with a friend who owns a brandy distillery in California. And uh, one of the, and we actually had that same discussion about the balancing in, 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 in it was around wood selection and why if you need to influence character, the difference between charring wood and toasting wood and just the level of penetration, which is counterintuitive because if you think you char that you get more penetration into the wood, but in reality you don't, you get toasting because if you char, you're eliminating all the wood character with the char mm -hmm. and creating a filter basically yeah. And you still haven't done anything to the wood inside the char unless you've toasted it ahead of time. So Absolutely. that's right, a great, uh, that's a great, that's, did you publish that study anywhere? Is it just in books in your house? Just in books in your house. A couple of questions here. Um, Eddie from Heritage Wine Cellars here in Chicago wants to say hello. She's from County Limerick and loves selling your stuff in Chicago. And yeah. she also asks, uh, if you think people are part of the terroir because she does, that sounds like some philosophical nonsense, not meant for a scientist like John. Yes. Uh, my two cents on that, Eddie. We appreciate the question. <laughs> <laughs> We've also got a question from Facebook. Uh, Spencer asked- What does those that mean? If there's terroir, that means that you can tell the difference between somebody from Cork and somebody from Limerick. Yeah. Oh. Well, um, number one, I, I, I'd like to congratulate um, Limerick on their recent All Ireland final and coming from a Corkman. That's um, that's um, um, that's a, a brave thing to do. But um, Ireland, you might know from your travels, is probably, and I say this being a proud Irishman, is probably the most parochial country in the world. Yeah. Uh, so you know, <laughs> you can absolutely tell the difference between a Cork and Limerick person. Um. Yeah. I don't want to wade too deep into that, I suppose. Um, what, I did want to get back to the single malt, though. So we have this eight-year-old single malt that we recently just got in Chicago. I'm not sure how long that's been around. Um, what, uh, can you give us more? So single malt, double pot distilled. Uh, what kind of barrels was this malt aged in then before well, it got to us? Well, that would all be um, triple distilled, um, single malt. Oh, triple distilled, I'm sorry. It, no, it would um, be aged in first food bourbon casks. We, uh, um, it sounds like um, counterintuitive in a way, but we look for, we'd be quite selective in the type of bourbon casks that we use. And um, we'd look for um, bourbon casks that um, uh, have um, had um, bourbon, quite young bourbon in them. Um, you know, I've said that to a couple of people and they say, um, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you go for a more premium bourbon mm -hmm. cask? Um, but our our simple logic is that, um, you know, if you um, get a bourbon with um, a younger bourbon cask, there's obviously more in the wood to give. So um, we've, um, we, we, it would be um, quite young bourbon casks and that we'd use predominantly. Um, we partner with a company in Kentucky called Kelvin Cooperage. Oh, we uh, love Cal. By the way, love Paul. Very, yeah. we, we have a good relationship with Paul. Love Kelvin Cooperage. They're they're a fantastic company. Which, um, as you know, you know, back in the early um, about two thousand eight to about two thousand twelve, there was a big um, shortage in bourbon casks, and you know, Kelvin and our sets of always got on well, and they helped us tremendously during that very challenging period, and. Um, we owe an awful lot both to Paul and the late Kevin, and um, they're a fantastic company. And um, we're doing some very interesting innovations with them recently as well, which we'd hope to bring to the market quite soon, you know? Yeah. And they're Scottish, which people, if you don't know in the United States, for they're, 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 they're Scottish, Scottish family. They are. Um, so 100% bourbon wood then on this eight year? Yes, indeed. Yes. Okay. Interesting. It's got a it's got a nice kind of dark round character. I wouldn't uh, I don't know if I would have necessarily pegged it as 100 percent bourbon, but it's you know, it's bright and fruity. It's it's pretty. I think everything you would expect in a triple distilled Irish single malt, just with that, you know, relatively fresh, fruity character. Fruit, yes. tropical. Yeah, very, yeah. very tropical, very palm fruit, apple and green apple. Yes, it does have a good weight to it, um, as Joe points out, like really nice mouthfeel to it, even at eight years old. Uh, all right. Well, why don't we move on to the IPA cask? I, I love this. Because this is fascinating. Yeah, this this IPA 
so John, when did you, cause you guys have done even earlier, I remember having, having things that you have done cask finishing, which of course a lot of folks are doing. Um, when did you start playing with the beer casks? We started working on those, I think, in around 2018. Okay. Um, but we wanted to put our own little twist in it. Um, so um, before we, we partnered with a company called um, Black Distillery in Kinsale, which is um, a brewery right on just west of Cork City in a lovely town called Kinsale. And um, we took the uh, IPA and the malt but we did something quite unique in that we dehydrated um, the um, IPA and the malt using hydrostatic filtration prior to um, putting it in the cask um, and then put that in the cask and um, obviously disgorged and then um, put the whiskey in by this partial dehydration using hydrostatic filtration, which is a non-thermal concentration technique. You actually get much more bang to the book so um, I would hope anyway that both the IPA and the single cask or, and the stout cask are, are very authentic and, you know, um, they are what they say they do. You know, you, the stout is very chocolatey and, um, and um, sweet and um, you get that very definitive stout malt um, attributes. Well, the IPA, you really do get that, that hoppy um, sort of lime citrus um, flavor attribute. So um, it's something about the IPA and the stout are something that we're quite proud of um, in that um, it does what it says on the pack, you know, which is important to us. Yeah. Well, Pat, there's IPA definitely cask there's... Is crazy. I, I mean, we've had a couple other IPA casts and I've always kind of approached them as a gimmick and they tend to be a little bit of bitterness comes through them. They tend to have this just grassy greenness to them, understandably. Um, but this is definitely, it shows more of that citrus that you would associate with those more kind of modern American, you know, well, now I guess traditional American sea hops, whether it's, you know, Cascade, Columbus, those type of, those really typical grapefruit rind kind of lemony hops. This is nice. It, it's, it's, it's still a whiskey though. And it doesn't taste like, I don't know. It, it doesn't taste like it was just like poured in some hoppy beer and then bottled it up. You know, this, it, it still has a round cast character to it. Yeah no, we were, we're, yeah. no, the nose is amazing. I mean, that that's where the nose is amazing because the nose is just, I mean, the whiskey's there, but the nose is just that fresh. This is the first time I've tasted it. This is really impressive. Joe wrote the review for the email last week and I said, I'd hold off on tasting it until we could taste it live on the zoom call. Yes. So we just got in and I believe that we've got, there was only a limited amount that came to Chicago. So, mm -hmm. and we have sold a nice chunk of it. So if you want any more in Chicago, you might want to come and grab it pretty soon. Wow. This is great. What other, uh, do you have other projects with breweries that you're working on now um, that you can maybe tease in the vein of this? Yes, we, we, we did a project with um, Castle Island Brewery in, um, in Boston, and um, that worked out. That was a very local um, release for the Massachusetts area, but that worked out very well. But I, I suppose one of the biggest projects that we took on in the last um, 18 months is um, we released a range of single malts, um, uh, sherry, rum, port, virgin oak, and um, Calvados cask, um, range of single malts where um, we took a very conscious decision that we wanted to have complete um, transparency and providence in the cask. So we went, we didn't go through um, brokerages to source the cask. We went directly to the fortified wine and spirit producers and said, we want to buy your casks, but we want it to be a partnership. We want you to approve the liquid and we want to name the distillery or the fortified wine um, producer on the on, on our label. So we it was very, very challenging exercise, as you might imagine. So we hooked up with um, distillery Garnier, who make a fantastic Calvados in France, and Bodegas Boron, a Sherry Bodega in um, Spain, Quinta de Boro in Portugal um, for the port, and Kelvin Cooperage for the Virgin Oak, and um, and that, that actual project has worked out very well, but 
as you'd imagine, extremely challenging because, um, you know, if these girls are going to put their name on the label, um, you know, they want to satisfy yeah. themselves that the liquid is of an ample quality. So that was um, a big, big challenge for us, um, but it worked out quite well, thank God. That's cool. Um, so what else, I mean, we've had a pretty wide array of West Cork whiskeys over the last probably even four years now. Is there a uh, core of the portfolio that people should be looking out for outside of this eight year and the bourbon cask? Yeah, one does and probably the unsung hero. And, um, and I'm not sure if you listen is the black cask, which is- okay. um, We've I, got that too, yeah. It's a it's lovely, black reserve. Yeah, yeah. That's um, a lovely whiskey, very high malt content of around 33% malt, um, all aged and first filled bourbon casks and then finished in, um, in, um, in, um, in double charred cask char level number five, which adds a lovely sweetness, vanilla, um, and um, sort of toffee, caramel attributes. So mm. that's, that's been a really successful. Um, another sort of one accidental hero in a way, which was, um, it was almost a bait in a lot of ways, was um, the cast strength or barrel proof, which we developed. Um, we were working with um, Frank McCarty from Book Laddick, and, mm -hmm. and Springbank and um, the late Dr. Barry Walsh, who um, it was my personal inspiration in the Irish whiskey. He was the most fantastic man, um, worked as a um, master blender for 40 years and probably the kindest man I've met um, since joining the whiskey industry. But um, I had never been um, a subscriber to the, this um, slow blending exercise. Um, where people reduce from cast strength to 40% um, over a period of time. Um, I couldn't see the scientific logic. Um, you know, if you have sufficient um, shear in your mixing, um, I, I couldn't see why a rapid um, reduction in ABV would have any deleterious impact. But um, we were challenged and um, to create a blend as a um, cast strength 62% and allow it rest in an exhausted cask and um, allow it to marry for, uh, that's the word that they love to use, um, for the slow um, and, and it did actually produce a very good whiskey. Um, one that is hopefully a tribute to um, Dr. Barry Walsh. Um, I personally would put it down, maybe this is as um, it's an oxidative improvement rather than a marrying or blending per se, but maybe that's my get out of jail um, clause, you know, um, so in, in the challenge. That's good. So are you, do you guys have anything in bottle? Because you said you've done three styles. One thing we've talked about grain, we've talked about uh, and blended and malt, um, pure pot or single pot. Have you any of that coming in the bottle anytime soon? Great question. Did you, we do indeed, yeah. We'll have um, pots still launched in 2021. We were meant to do that prior to now, but um, we had to liquidate some pots still um, bulk liquid um, back in 2019, uh, which um, put that launch back a bit. But um, that is something we'll do in 2021 for sure. Um, I suppose we just want to be careful that it's um, it's we do it at the right time and um, that the quality is good enough, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah. Personally, we're very excited about pot still as a category. Um, I think that um, you know it's a fantastic category that um, Irish whiskey can contribute a lot to. Yep. Um, you might know there's a lot of debate in Ireland at the moment around the mash bill for pot still. Um, you know in terms of the mesh restrictions, but, um, you know, hopefully they'll change in the course of time and pot will become a more and more interesting category, but it's one that excites us hugely. Yeah. Too, and it uh, seems, we're huge fans. Yeah. well, it's quite, and it's, it's a beautiful, the beautiful whiskeys come from it. And it is truly uniquely Irish. I mean, malt is made all over the world. Grain, in certain ways or forms are made, but that is something that's really truly Irish. Yes, to us is 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 that use of the unmalted barley. The um the mash bill debate's interesting, and because uh, you know we got that Kilbegan whiskey that was the rye 
when they made it, it would have been allowed to be called a pot still. But by the time it was getting bottled, they had changed that rule and it had too high of a rye content or whatever, um, and maybe not enough unmalted barley or something. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's arguably one of the most now, you know, whether tradition's modern or not, a very obviously traditional Irish style. But I think at the same time, it allows for a lot of experimentation like that. So, and so uh, you know, if they did loosen those mash bill restrictions a bit, I think you can maintain that Irish identity and still have, you know, you, you can have some really cool uh, advancements and innovations, I think, in the Irish whiskey well. I would be in favor of calling those things pot still, but I have no skin in the game outside of right. getting to taste them all, I suppose. So, yeah. Well, and, yeah, and very broadly, for those for, for those folks who aren't for very broadly a pure pot still or a pot still in the Irish style is a combination of malt and uh, malted and unmalted barley. Yeah, which has some historical context to basically tax avoidance, depending mm -hmm. upon how all the story is told. A lot of it was tax avoidance 100 plus, you know, 150 years ago when when the Brits controlled Ireland, mm -hmm. when they had a very, very severe malt tax to try to stop drinking, which is another very, very clever way in which the Irish uh, said, OK, right, we can get around this. <laughs> Man, I'm looking forward to tasting that pot still. That'll be fun. Um, yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, uh, anybody, if anybody else doesn't have any other questions for John, uh, it's getting late there. And I personally need a Guinness. I don't know what everybody else's plans are tonight, but I haven't had a Guinness yet today. And I'm genetically, ob ob uh, genetically obligated, obviously, to get a Guinness on St. Patrick's Day. I know. I know. Uh, I don't know if Guinness is drank as much down in the South, right? It's all Murphy's down there, right, John? It would be a mixture of um, Guinness, Murphy's, and there's also a third one, Beamish, which is not well known, but is actually a lovely... I like Beamish. You can't get it anymore in the States, though. Yeah, it's, it's a bummer. Very, yeah, it's very hard to get, but it would be a really good... Um, it, it's quite it's quite similar to Guinness, I think, in that it's um, you know a very sort of almost not as creamy as Murphy's. It would be a little more bitter, and um, but... Any, any of the three are good to, uh, I, I, you wouldn't say no to any of them if the bars are open again now. I like that your answer is, which one is drank down there? And your answer was all three. <laughs> <laughs> not the ciders. Well, how are you, how are, so we're, so how are you, how are you, um, how are you weathering in Skibbery? How are you weathering the, the pandemic? What is your, are your pubs open or no, or? No, um, no. And they're much uh, more responsible than us. <laughs> all the pubs are closed, unfortunately. Um, to be honest, it's, um, it's a challenging time at the moment in Ireland. And that, um, I think the Irish are a fairly sociable breed of people. And, um, you know, two St. Patrick's in a row with um, no parades and all mixing, I think, is it's challenging. But, you know, yeah. the whole world is seeing these challenging times. So, um, yeah. Yeah, well, we're almost we're we're hopefully getting close. I know that things seem to be looking up. At least they're 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 looking up here, and uh, you know we hope that they're looking up in Ireland as well. Yes, you know, I do it in time. Yes, absolutely. Because Pat, Pat, and Joe are mad because I've got an I've at least had the chance to walk through West Cork Distillers and have told them numerous stories about what there is to see. So I think Pat and Joe are looking for the opportunity to come and see it for themselves. Yeah. Yeah, you'd be more than welcome. Um, word of warning that, um, you know, from about April to September is the best time, you know, um, September to April on the winter side can be fairly in his spot, inhospitable with rain and uh, wind. Um, but you'd be more than welcome anytime. We appreciate Excellent. that, John. And uh, thank you again for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you, everybody who tuned in and checked this out and tasted along with us. A uh, lot of interesting whiskeys getting made at West Cork and a lot of whiskey at that period, uh, 16 stills under one roof. Absolutely crazy. Um, so anyway, thanks again, John. Thanks for everybody for tuning in. Uh, Brett and Joe and I will be back on Friday with Nicole, Austin Nicole and George Austin. Nickel tasting their new 15 year single barrel. So John, thanks again, man. We appreciate it. Um, looking forward to getting to taste some pot still here eventually. Cheers everyone. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Sanja. Sanja. Cheers.